Welcome to Race Healer TV. I'm Milagros Phillips, your host. This show is dedicated to the infinite men and women who have, by their courage, their conviction, and their dedication, devoted themselves to healing the racial divide. It is also dedicated to you, who are looking for answers and ways to understand race and to do something different so that we can heal that which comes between us. I am so excited that today we have a very, very special guest. Her name is Katrina Brown. Katrina is the producer and director of the Emmy-nominated documentary called Traces of the Trade, a story from the Deep North. So many of us think that um, slavery only happened in the South, but the North was not only complicit, but there was slavery in the North as well. Today's guest has grappled with healing and transformation around the discovery of this history. Welcome to the show. I'm so excited to have you with us, Katrina. Thank um, you. We, uh, you and I have had quite a journey, yes. but I want you to talk about the journey that we just saw on the trailer of your documentary, because it wasn't just one of those things where y you were just in one place. You had to travel yes. to make this documentary and go deep into your history by going to all these different places. So tell us about that. Sure. Um, the basic structure of the film is that it follows 10 of us who are DeWolf descendants as we retrace the triangle trade. So mm -hmm. the idea was to go to the actual places to confront the history, not just stay at home. Um, so we started in Rhode Island and spent a week there in Bristol um, talking with historians and each other. Um, so starting on the, you know, the old DeWolf hometown and then we spent a week in Ghana visiting the slave forts. And um, I can tell you more about the time in Ghana if you like. Um, and then a week in Cuba, which is where the DeWolfs owned sugar and coffee plantations. They basically had their whole own triangle trade um, that they operated over the course of three, gen three generations. Um, and the other sort of key, key thing to share is that um, I was given a list by my great uncle of a um, couple hundred DeWolf descendants, um, mm. most of whom I didn't know. You know, these were distant cousins. Um, so I wrote to about 200 people and um, shared what for some of them was news. Some mm. of them didn't know this at all. Some of them did know it um, and invited them to come with me on this journey to retrace the triangle trade. And when all was said and done um, through a process of discussion, nine people ended up coming with me. So 10 of us, um, which included first cousins, seventh cousins, <laughs> two sisters, two brothers, a father and a son. So from very close relatives to very distant relatives. Um, but most of us didn't know each other um, before going on this journey. So how was that received by these members of the family who had no <coughs> idea of this history? Um, what happened when you started to talk to them about that history? Um, well, you can, you can probably imagine how upsetting it was. Um, and it, I think there's this added layer because of the fact that these were Rhode Island ancestors. So mm. there's this upset that's very personal. Um, and then there's this, like, uh, this, I'll, I'll speak for myself, for example. It, there's this kind of initial sense of this does not compute. You know, this mm. does not compute. It's cognitive dissonance because I, like most Americans, was raised... Um, associating slavery with the South, not with the North. And um, so when, when I first found out about my ancestors, I assumed they were the only slave traders in New England, because how could there be more? That was a Southern mm. thing. So, um, so I think for me and for my relatives, it was a sort of a double whammy to, to take it on both personally in terms of our family and then just kind of as New Englanders, as Northerners. Sure, absolutely, yeah. People still struggle with that whole idea that slavery was only in the South. But in reality, we now know that the whole world was complicit mm -hmm. because there were products and services that were being offered worldwide mm -hmm. that, you know, that people were participating in, whether they were aware of it or not. Yeah, and the, the one of the many, you can imagine how many lessons I learned along the way, um, uh, how many wake-up calls I got, um, one key one y is you're alluding to it. Um, I, 
I think I went in assuming that what I was going to have to reckon with the most was my actual ancestors and, and the, the sort of the evil and how could they have done that. <coughs> and that was part of it. But the more chilling part was coming face to face with the ordinary citizens, mm. people like me who thought, you know, woke up every morning thinking they're good people, God fearing, et cetera. But by buying sugar, buying coffee, buying cotton clothes, you know, tobacco, et cetera, coffee, they were complicit in the slave economy. And that's, um, sadly, that's more that you can draw a connection to the present day in ways that we participate still in yeah. economic exploitation and slavery, truthfully, um, up to the present day while we walk around thinking of ourselves as good people. So, yeah. 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 I mean, a lot of this is um, about becoming conscious, becoming racially conscious, becoming aware of the fact that we don't, we don't live in a vacuum. We are all connected. It's an interconnected world. And so um, when there's a dysfunction somewhere, it affects all of us. Yeah. And that's why the healing process is so important, you know, just being aware of that. Yeah. So, how did you even come to discover this history? I, I, I remember seeing or reading something that it was related to your grandmother. Mm -hmm. Tell um, us about that. My grandmother in her um, early 90s um, in a way that I think is um, just fundamentally meaningful, the idea of wanting to be sure that family history is being passed on mm -hmm. um, sure. when you know you're coming to the towards the end of your life. Um, so she, with my mom, um, set about to write a little booklet that was a summary of our family history. And not surprisingly, it was primarily focused on things she was proud of. And yet, very much to her credit, she put in two sentences about the slave trade which, you know, she could have made a totally different choice and not mentioned them at all. So I'm eternally grateful to her for including that. And when I received it in the mail on an ordinary day, um, when I was in seminary in my late 20s, um, those sentences jumped off the page and hit me, you know, um, like a thunderbolt. And um, uh, it was a strange experience because I was totally shocked and upset the first moment of reading it. Um, sure. And then literally within moments, I realized that I already knew. Mm. But I couldn't believe that I already knew because it didn't feel like something conscious. So it was like a real clear awareness of like mm. the unconscious part of your brain and the conscious part of your brain and the tricks we play on ourselves yeah. to deal with things that we're not comfortable with and that we can't deal with. Um, so it's a, it's a study in um, an individual process of amnesia that I realized pretty quickly was kind of a mirror of the collective process of amnesia in the white northern psyche. So, yeah. so I don't know when I first found out. I think I probably, it probably was mentioned in passing when I was a kid. Um, mm. But I don't, I, I don't think there was ever a moment where you know, my parents sat me down and said, we have something to tell you. I don't think there's something like that that happened, but it was, it was probably mentioned in an offhand way. Sure, yeah. I think it was John Bradshaw that wrote about family secrets. Uh. And um, family secrets, not from the perspective of your family's trying to keep a secret from you, but rather from the perspective of the things that family members don't talk about the things that remain unmentioned and quiet, and how people act out of that dysfunction without even knowing, like there's this knowing, there's this inner knowing that we have, because human beings are so much more than just flesh and bones, right? We, we have this inner knowing, and um, our gut tells us when something is off, mm -hmm. and then we act out of those secrets without being aware of what the secrets actually are. Right. And then when we discover them, we go, oh, that's what that discomfort. That explains it. Yes, that yeah. explains it. Yeah. yeah. My cousin Kyla has one of my favorite lines in the film, which is she says, what kind of crazy partnership do we have with silence? Mm. That's powerful. Yeah. We're going to take a station break, and we will continue speaking with Katrina Brown about traces of the trade. 
Hello, I'm Milagros Phillips. I'm the facilitator of Race Demystified. For the past 20 plus years, I've been facilitating a program that takes two days. It's intense, it's powerful, and it's life transforming. Those who have attended that program simply say they never see race the same way again. It's a program that transforms our views, that gives us a new way of looking at this thing we call race, but also reconnects us. It gives us information that leads to transformation, and it leads to unity, it leaves us empowered, and it leaves us with a sense of knowing that there is something that I can do about this thing we call race and racism. Join us at Race Demystified. To get more information, simply visit my website, www.milagrosphillips.com. I am so excited to welcome you to that program. It'll forever transform the way that you view race. Welcome back to Race Healer TV. I'm your host, Milagros Phillips, and we are speaking with Katrina Brown about traces of the trade and how she traced her family history and the importance of all of us doing that as much as we can as part of a healing process. Welcome back, Katrina. Thank you. So there were 10 of you all together mm -hmm. that went on this journey. And given the, the, the topic, there must have been some emotional charge that came up at one point or another. Would you like to share about that? Because that's, I think, so often we stay away from the emotional piece around race, and yet race is emotionally charged for people. We need to be able to deal with that. We need to acknowledge that it's there and then do the best we can with it. So tell us about that. My question is, when was it not emotionally charged? <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it, uh, interestingly enough, I think there was a little bit of a, I think it's fair to characterize there having been a bit of a gender difference where the women mm. tended, so not to perpetuate a stereotype, but sure. <laughs> um, I think there was more emotional intensity and then a desire for emotional processing um, among the women. We were split half and half. Um, in the family, half women and half men. Mm. And the men, I think, were a little more eager to get to a kind of public policy type conversation. And I, boy, I honor both of those so deeply, the importance of both. So um, I would never say we need to do all emotional healing or all more rational, cognitive, policy, political um, type of work. I think they, they go hand in hand. And mm -hmm. I completely agree with you that we tend to under-emphasize the importance of the emotional charge and the emotional healing needed. And I'll speak as a white person. Um, there's often a whole, there's a whole host of emotions that can come up for white folks. And, and I've been on the road with the film for 11 years now. So I've seen um, all kinds of responses and, and you know, you don't have to be a descendant of such an extreme family as mine to have charge around this. So mm. white folks can have feelings of shame, guilt, desire to avoid shame and guilt, which creates its own kind of response of defensiveness and pushback, even sometimes some anger with that, like don't draw me into this, don't blame me, I didn't do it or my people didn't do it. There's a real charge to that that kind of begs the question of like, why so much charge? Um, and people often say, well, my family just got here. They didn't own slaves. Like, right. what do I have to do with this? Right, and this, yeah. is where, this is where the studying history becomes really important because I have, you know, so I, I have lots of ancestors, <laughs> like we all do, and um, I have some ancestors who fit that type of narrative where they came poor from France and Ireland, um, and had to work in factories and had to work their way up and struggled. So I could claim that part of my heritage as well and say that, you know, that part is somehow free of responsibility. But the reality that I've come to learn from this process is that um, the whole reason people came here for jobs was because it was a booming economy. And the whole reason it was a booming economy is because it was built on unpaid labor. So you can draw absolute connections between even those who didn't necessarily own slaves and the benefits they got and the leg up they got and the ability they got to assimilate into white middle class culture, like some of my ancestors got to assimilate 
in ways that um, African Americans were being denied at the same time. Absolutely, yeah. And it's important for people to recognize that and um, to acknowledge that. Um, so often people feel charged when you say, oh, but you're a white person and you have privilege. Well, I don't have any privilege. I'm a poor white person. And um, you know, there's a whole nother level and a whole nother layer of that that needs to be explained because of the color of a person's skin, whether you have melanin or not, the texture of your hair, uh, you know, all of those things that make a difference in whether you can assimilate or not assimilate. Yeah. Like a lot of Jewish families were able to assimilate in the 1930s and 40s when they were arriving here in the U.S. And in fact, that was a big thing with uh, Jewish families, um, you know, assimilating. And yet there were all these families of color, like the Mexican families and, and so on, that couldn't assimilate mm -hmm. because of the structure of the assimilation process. Yeah, so. yeah. Um, Jewish people faced a ton of um, anti-Semitism. Catholics faced anti-Catholic sentiment. Yeah. So there was very real oppression from people like my ancestors who were the sort of Anglo, Northeastern elite. So the obstacles were real, but there was kind of a process where assimilation was I mean, it's it's um, it's a painful subject, you know. Um, there was a sort of who gets to assimilate and who doesn't, and how does the prejudice, you know? It, there's still humans will find any kind of way to slice and dice each other and mm -hmm. to create others, yeah. the other. Um, so I think I'm I've certainly been um, humbled in the last few years to be thinking more about class differences within white America and to realize that I shouldn't be so quick to conflate um, my experience with that of poor white folks and poor working class. So I think it's, it's a both and. It's like mm. they don't have to face the race discrimination that people with darker skin face and, um, and yet they face very real obstacles that people like me don't face who are sort of solidly upper middle class. Um, Absolutely. So yeah. learning how to like hear each other's pain and, and yeah. be present to it and empathize and all that. Compassion, compassion. is really important yeah. in this journey, having yeah. compassion. Yeah. So you've had this amazing experience. How has it changed your life and um, how, if, if healing, some healing has happened for you, what would you say that is? And, mm. and what, is that, what does that healing look like and taste like and feel like mm. for you? Um, uh, there's so many things to say. <laughs> um, so I, I, I that, you know, the initial, very early on, I think I assumed that facing this would make my relationships with people of color, people of African descent specifically, um, harder, like if people knew this about me, that was the sort of naive assumption, and it won't surprise you to hear, because you know <laughs> from our relationship um, that kind of the opposite is true, that once I was able to sort of stand in telling the truth, um, that that creates a, a kind of groundedness um, that allows for a more authentic relationship. Um, and in a weird way, the, the human psyche is so interesting. Um, in a weird way, it was like before I dealt with it, I felt unconsciously guilty all the time, mm. like almost as if I had done it. Like I just, like yeah. when I was in college, I joined the gospel choir, the all black gospel choir, but I was so full of guilt. So I was totally a attracted and drawn to the black spiritual church tradition. Um, but I felt so guilty as a white person. And I think I knew that I was a slave trader descendant that I didn't socialize with anyone. I just kept to myself because I didn't want to bother them with my white presence. Mm. So when it was all unconscious, it was very dysfunctional. And yeah. the more I faced it and the more I talked to people about it and made it what has basically become my, f my, my calling and my life's work, um, I can have you know healthier, more authentic relationships, which doesn't mean there's not still moments and privilege issues and blinders and so on and so forth. So the, the learning continues for sure, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, but It's lifelong learning. It's lifelong. It really is. Yeah. I mean, um, one of the things that I remind people of is the fact that we didn't come at this today. This is a 500-year-old legacy, you know, um, 400 certainly in this 
particular part of the world, but 500 throughout the Caribbean and so on. And you don't heal that in a day. Correct. Um, it's lifelong learning. It's taking risks. It's um, being willing to take responsibility for the history and being more self-forgiving and self-compassionate because it, you know, none of us uh, right now, we, we can't say, well, you're responsible for racism. It's a collective history, but we all have responsibility to heal it and transform it. Mm -hmm. And the only way we do that is by facing the history. Yeah. And I think that a lot of what happens in our nation is people don't want to face the history because because of some of the things that you just brought up, you yeah. know? And weirdly enough, people, I think a lot of folks who push back and say like, don't blame me, that wasn't me, that wasn't my people, um, it's because they feel they're gonna be held accountable in a personal way. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think um, in my experience, people of African descent are a lot more clear headed than that <laughs> and have a basic awareness like people say to me all the time like I'm not mad at you mm -hmm. uh, you know I'm mad at this the persistence of the inequities I'm mad at the system that like I love the the term head starts mm -hmm. I think it's such a helpful concept to sort of say you know white people got a big head start due to the system of slavery and and the other forms of racism so now that our country has you know for the most part, forsworn overt racism and discrimination legally and theoretically um, in, our, in our human relations. N now that we've done that, that doesn't mean there aren't still people that are further ahead and that we, you know, we can deal with that without people having to feel like they're being personally attacked. Mm, so, absolutely. Yeah. So in your own personal healing, um, what would you say to our audience? There are a lot of folks in our audience who are in a place where they feel like, oh, you know, I'm just not sure if I can face that history or uh, I don't know what to do and how is this going to impact my life? Like, what would you say to them? Um, well, I, I prefer to speak to my white brothers and sisters. So yes, that's please. who I would be speaking to. Sure. Um, I think a huge lesson for me was the idea that that um, in a sense I alluded to a little bit ago, the idea that my own healing is wrapped up in this, not just yours, so um, that I do this on behalf of myself as well as you. And um, you know, I come at this less out of guilt than out of grief and a sense of right and wrong. Mm. And, um, and doing that enables me to notice how this, s the, the, the ways of othering others and the ways of racism um, hurt me and hurt my own sense of humanity and, mm -hmm. and keep me feeling disconnected rather than connected. Um, so, so I think it's actually, it's a little bit taboo to say, you know, for white folks, there's a self-interest. <laughs> sure. yeah. um, but I think once, I mean, at the most basic level, racism is a fiction, race, race is a fiction not racism, race is a fiction. So if, if the biological reality is that we have like 99.9999999% more in common with each other than different, and mm -hmm. if anything, I might have more difference from another white person who has a di different genetic um, history than I might even have from you. Um, given that race is a fiction, we should be all wanting to do what we can to get over that, you know, fake construct. Absolutely. So Yeah. It takes courage to be willing to do that. And I admire and respect your courage. And I'm so glad. Katrina and I actually met uh, working on a project called Congressional Conversations on Race. And uh, we co-facilitated a program together some years back. And we've been friends ever since. I love your courage. I love your um, authenticity and your willingness to speak about this. I love that you've devoted your life to the healing process and to transformation, which as far as I'm concerned, has earned you the title of race healer. Mm. <laughs> 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 so I'm really happy to have you mm. um, as we premiere this show on the show. Tell some of our audience, um, all of our audience, 
um, how they can learn more about Traces of the Trade and about the work that you're currently doing. Um, the film's website is tracesofthetrade.org. Um, and um, I've actually just finished a project for the Episcopal Church, um, which is a race dialogue series for parishes, for congregations, um, using films. So it's a 10-session mm -hmm. series um, walking through American history of race and racism and whiteness, um, not just black-white, but Native American, Latino, Asian American. Um, so it's using some incredible films that I um, am so thrilled to be able to share with people. Um, and uh, if folks are interested, that's at the Episcopal Church website. It's called Sacred Ground, um, and it's available. Y you need an Episcopal parish involved, but others can get involved as well if they're interested. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for continuing your work, and thank you for being a race healer. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for being on You're the welcome. show, Katrina. Thank you. <laughs>